Through a Dragon's Eye The next morning, Aragorn woke with stiff limbs and purple bruises. He saw Brom carry the saddle to Sephira and tried to quell his uneasiness. By the time breakfast was ready, Brom had strapped the saddle onto Sephira and hung Aragorn's bags from it. When his bowl was empty, Aragorn silently picked up his bow and went to Sephira. Brom said, Now, remember, grip with your knees and guide her with your thoughts, and stay as flat as you can on her back. Nothing will go wrong, if you don't panic. Aragorn nodded, sliding his, sliding his unstrung bow into its leather tube, and Brom boosted him into the saddle. Sephira waited impatiently while Aragorn tightened the bands around his legs. Are you ready? she asked. He sucked in the fresh morning air. No, but let's do it. She agreed enthusiastically. He braced himself as she crouched, her powerful legs surged, and the air whipped past him, snatching his breath away. With three smooth strokes of her wings, she was in the sky, climbing rapidly. The last time Aragorn had ridden Sephira, every flap of her wings had been strained. Now she flew steadily and effortlessly. He clenched his arms around her neck as she turned on edge, banking. The river shrunk to a wispy, grey line beneath them. Clouds floated around them. When they leveled off high above the plains, the trees below were no more than specks. The air was thin, chilly, and perfectly clear. This is wonderful. His words were lost as Sephira tilted and rolled completely around. The ground spun in a dizzying circle and Vertigo clutched Aragon. Don't do that, he cried. I feel like I'm going to fall off. You must become accustomed to it. If I'm attacked in the air, that's one of the simplest maneuvers I will do, she replied. He could think of no rebuttal, so he concentrated on controlling his stomach. Sephira angled into a shallow dive and slowly approached the road. Although Aragon's stomach lurked with every wobble, he began to enjoy himself. He relaxed his arms a bit and stretched his neck back, taking in the scenery. Sephira let him enjoy the sights a while and then said, Let me show you what flying is really like. How? he asked. Relax and do not be afraid, she said. Her mind tugged at his, pulling him away from his body. Aragon fought for a moment, then surrendered control. His vision blurred, and he found himself looking through Sephira's eyes. Everything was distorted. Colors had weird, exotic tints. Blue were, blues were more prominent now, while greens and reds were subdued. Aragon tried to turn his head and body, but could not. He felt like a ghost who had slipped out of the ether. Pure joy radiated from Sephira as she climbed into the sky. She loved this freedom to go anywhere. When they were high above the ground, she looked back at Aragon. He saw himself as she did, hanging onto her back with a blank look. He could feel her body strain against the air, using updrafts to rise. All her muscles were like his own. She could feel her tail swinging through the air like a giant rudder to correct her course. It surprised him how much she depended on it. Their connection grew stronger until there was no distinction between their identities. They clasped their wings together and dived straight down like a spear thrown from on high. No terror of falling touched Aragon, engulfed as he was in Sephira's exhilaration. The air rushed past their face, their tail whipped in the air, and their joined minds reveled in the experience. Even as they pummeled towards, plummeted towards the ground, there was no fear of collision. They snapped open their wings at just the right moment, pulling out of the dive with their combined strength. Slanting towards the sky, they shot up and continued back over in a giant loop. As they leveled out, their minds began to diverge, becoming distinct personalities again. For a split second, Aragon felt both his body and Sephira's, then his vision blurred and again he sat on her back. He gasped and collapsed on the saddle. It was minutes before his heart stopped hammering and his breathing calmed. Once he had recovered, he exclaimed, That was incredible! 
How can you bear the land when you enjoy flying so much? I must eat, she said with some amusement, but I am glad that you took pleasure in it. Those are spare words for such an experience. I'm sorry I haven't flown with you more. I never thought it could be like that. Do you always see so much blue? It is the way I am. We fly together. We Will we fly? We will fly together more often now? Yes, every chance we get. Good, she replied in a contented tone. They exchanged many thoughts as she flew talking as they had not for weeks. Zephyr showed Aragon how she used hills used hills and trees to hide and how she could conceal herself in the shadow of a cloud. They scouted the trail for Brom, which proved to be more arduous than Aragon expected. They could not see the path unless Zephyr flew very close to it, in case in which case she risked being detected. Near midday, an annoying buzz filled Aragon's ears, and he became aware of a strange pressure on his mind. He shook his head, trying to get rid of it, but the tension only grew stronger. Brahm's words about how people could break into each other's minds flashed through Aragon's head, and he frantically tried to clear his thoughts. He concentrated on one of Saphira's scales and forced himself to ignore everything else. The pressure faded for a moment and then returned, greater than ever. A sudden gust rocked Saphir and Aragon's concentration slipped. Before he could marshal any defenses, the force broke through. But instead of the invasive pressure of another mind, there were only the words. What do you think you're doing? Get down here, I found something important. Brom? queried Aragon. Yes? the old man said irritably. Now get that oversized lizard of yours to land. I'm here. He sent a picture of his location. Aragon quickly told Saphira where to go, and she banked towards the river below. Meanwhile, he strung his bow and drew several arrows. If there's trouble, I will be ready for it. As will I, said Saphira. When they reached Brom, Aragon saw him standing in a clearing, waving his arms. Saphira landed, and Aragon jumped off her and looked for danger. The horses were tied to a tree on the edge of the clearing, but otherwise Brom was alone. Aragon trotted over and asked, What's wrong? Aragon scratched Aragon. Brom scratched his chin and muttered a string of curses. Don't ever block me out like that again. It's hard enough for me to reach you without having to fight to make myself heard. Sorry, he snorted. I was further down the river when I noticed that the Razak's tracks had ceased. I backtracked until I found where they had disappeared. Look at the ground and tell me what you see. Aragon knelt and examined the dirt and found a confusion of impressions that were difficult to decipher. Numerous Razak footprints overlapped each other. Aragon guessed that the tracks were only a few days old. Superimposed over them were long, thick gouges torn into the ground. They looked familiar, but Aragon could not say why. He stood, shaking his head. I don't have any idea what... Then his eyes fell on Saphir, and he realized that he had made... What had made the gouges. Every time she took off, her back claws dug into the ground and ripped it in the same manner. This doesn't make any sense, but the only thing I can think of is that the Razak flew off on dragons, or else they got in onto giant birds and disappeared into the heavens. Tell me you have a better explanation? Brom shrugged. I've heard reports of the Razak moving from place to place with incredible speed, but this is the first evidence I've had of it. It will be almost impossible to find them if they have flying steeds. They aren't dragons. I know that much. A dragon would never consent to bear a Razak. What do we do? Saphira can't track them through the sky. Even if she could, she would leave you far behind. There's no easy solution to this riddle, said Brom. Let's have lunch while we think on it. Perhaps inspiration will strike us while we eat. Aragon glumly went to his bags for food. They ate in silence, staring at the empty sky. Once again, Aragon thought of home and wondered what Roran was doing. 
A vision of the burnt farm appeared before him and grief threatened to overwhelm him. What will I do if we can't find the Razak? What is my purpose then? I could return to Carvajal. He plucked a twig from the ground and snapped it in between two fingers. Or just travel with Brahm and continue my training? Aragon stared out at the plains, hoping to quiet his thoughts. When Brahm finished eating, he stood and threw back his hood. I have considered every trick I know, every word of power within my grasp, and all the skills I have, but I still don't see how we can find the Razak. Aragon slumped against Saphira in despair. Saphira could... Saphira could show herself at some town, that would draw the Razak like flies to honey, but it would be an extremely risky thing to attempt. The Razak would bring soldiers with them, and the king might be interested enough to come himself, which would spell certain death for you and me. So what now? asked Aragon, throwing his hands up. Do you have any ideas, Saphira? No. That's up to you, said Brom. This is your crusade. Aragon groaned. Aragon ground his teeth angrily and stalked away from Brahm and Zephira. Just as he was about to enter the trees, his foot struck something hard. Lying on the ground was a metal flask with a leather strap just long enough to hang off someone's shoulder. The silver insignia Aragon recognized as the Razak symbol was wrought onto it. Excited, he picked up the flask and unscrewed the cap. A cloying smell filled the air, the same one he had noticed when he found Garo in the wreckage of their house. He tilted the flask and a drop of clear, shiny liquid fell on his finger. Instantly, Aragon's finger burned as if it were on fire. He yelped and scrubbed his hand on the ground. After a moment, the pain subsided into a dull throbbing. A patch of skin had been eaten away. Grimacing, he jogged back to Brom. Look what I found. Brom took the flask and examined it, and then poured a bit of the liquid into the cap. Aragon started to warn him. Watch out, it'll burn my skin. I know, said Brom, and I suppose you went ahead and poured it all over your hand? Your finger? Well, at least you showed sense enough not to drink it. Only a puddle would have been left of you. What is it? asked Aragon. Oil from the petals of the Sethir plant, which grows on a small island behind, small island in the frigid northern seas. In its natural state, the oil is used for preserving pearls. It makes them lustrous and strong, but when specific words are spoken over the oil, along with a blood sacrifice, it gains the specific property to eat any flesh. That alone wouldn't make it special, there are plenty of acids that can dissolve sinew and bone, except for the fact that it leaves everything else untouched. You can dip anything into the oil and pull it out unharmed, unless it was once part of an animal or human. This has made it a weapon of choice for torture and assassination. It can be stored in wood, slathered on the point of a spear, or dipped into the sheets. It dipped dripped onto sheets so that the next person to touch them will be burned. There are a myriad of uses for it, limited only by your ingenuity. Any, any injury by it is always slow to heal. It's rather rare and expensive, especially in this converted form. Aragon remembered the terrible burns that had covered Garo. That's what they used on him, he realized with horror. I wonder why the Razak left it behind if it's so valuable. It must have slipped off when they flew away. But why didn't they come back for it? I doubt that the king will be pleased that they lost it. No, he won't, said Brom. But he would be even more disappointed if they delayed bringing him news of you. In fact, if the Razak have reached him by now, you can be sure that the king has learned your name. And that means he will have, we will have much more to be much more careful when you go into towns. There will be notices and alerts about you posted throughout the empire. Aragon paused to think. This oil, how rare is it exactly? Like diamonds in a pig trough, said Brom. 
He amended himself for after a second. Actually, the normal oil is used by jewelers, but only those who can afford it. So there are people who trade in it? Perhaps one, maybe two? Good, said Aragon. Now, do the cities along the coast keep sh shipping records? Brom's eyes brightened. Of course they do. If we could get to these records, they would tell us who brought the oil south and where it went from there. And the record of the Empire's purchase will tell us where the Razak live, concluded Aragon. I don't know how many people can afford this oil, but it shouldn't be hard to figure out which ones aren't working for the Empire. Genius, exclaimed Brom, smiling. I wish I had thought of this years ago. It would have saved me many headaches. The coast is dotted with numerous cities and towns where ships can land. I suppose that Terim would be the place to start as it controls most of the trade. Brom paused. The last I heard, my old friend Jayod lives there. We haven't seen each other for many years, but he might be willing to help us. And because he's a merchant, it may be possible that he has access to those records. How do we get to Terem? We'll have to go southwest until we reach a high pass in the spine. Once on the other side, we can head up the coast to Terem, said Brom. A gentle wind pulled at his hair. Can we reach the pass within a week? Easily. If we angle away from Nainor and to our right, we may be able to see the mountains by tomorrow. Aragon went to Saphira and mounted her. I'll see you at dinner, then. When they were at a good height, he said, I'm going to ride Kadok tomorrow, before you protest. Know that I am only doing it because I want to talk with Brom. You should ride with him every other day. That way you can still receive your instruction, and I will have the time to hunt. You won't be troubled by it. It is necessary. When they landed for the day, he was pleased to discover that his legs did not hurt. The saddle had protected him well from Saphir's scales. Aragon and Brom had their nightly fight, but it lacked energy as they were both preoccupied by the day's events. By the time they finished, Aragon's arms burned from Zarok's unaccustomed weight.